1929 type depression, which we could still end up in now because of what they've done. But I threw a lot of money in and we ended up not in a depression. And then we ended up with a very strong, you know, we, I ended up with a higher stock market than it was just previous to COVID coming in, which was pretty much of a miracle, according to most. But we had to throw money out there in order to keep our country going. We would have ended up, if I didn't do that, we would have ended up in a depression. The problem is when Biden came in, he took trillions and trillions of dollars for COVID. He didn't use it for COVID. He used it for other things, but he took trillions of dollars out. And that caused a lot of the inflation. Energy caused, his energy policies caused inflation and his spending, the, the unbelievable spending that they did caused inflation, tremendous inflation. And it's going to have an impact for a long time to come. Can you talk about your impoundment authority? intention. You mentioned that in the past, that you could go in and reduce the bureaucracy and the spend. I always tell people my position going into the election is less that I'm interested in knowing what the government's going to do for me. And I'm more interested in knowing what the government's going to stop doing that doesn't do any good for anyone. And there seems to be a lot of that. And I'm really curious to hear, sir, how you think about using the impoundment authority vested in you as president of the United States to reduce some of the bureaucracy wasteful spending and create accountability? And what's the, you, you know, is there a team that, that you've built around you to help build a specific plan on, on backing out of some of these issues? Right. We have a lot of money floating around that should be brought back into the government, should be given back to DC, to Washington. As you know, there's a lot of money given out over the last couple of years, especially over the last, my money was given out to help us with COVID. Then they took money and they have no idea what they're even doing with it that money can be given back and it should be given back and things can be done with that money that are a positive. But we have, there are many, many things. I'll give you an example, uh, education. We spend more on education per pupil than any other country. We spend numbers that are, and yet we're, we're terrible at it. We're down at the bottom of the list and yet we're at the top of the list. Uh, I would give, I am going to very early in the administration, we're gonna send education back to the States we're going to give them approximately half the number of dollars and they're going to have so much money that like they've never had before because they can spend a fraction of what we're spending right now and have much better school systems. As an example, you go to very, you could name many, you go to Nebraska, you go to Iowa, you go to many states, we'll do a far better job than we're doing right now and they'll do it for a fraction of the cost. We'll save a tremendous amount of money and have better. Some states, I don't believe we'll do a very good job, but they're going to have to learn to. But we have, uh, I would say most of our states will do a much better job. I think all of them will do better than, uh, you can't do worse than what we're doing right now, but all of them will do better. But some will be out absolutely education, a factory in a positive sense, factories. Uh, we are going to close up education. We'll have a tiny little group to make sure everyone's teaching at least English and perhaps proper math, et cetera, et cetera, but very little. Department of Education goes and education goes back to the states and where it belongs. I mean, where it absolutely belongs. And you're gonna save a lot of money. Uh, you can look at interior with that. You can look at uh, environmental with a lot of that where the environment can be controlled by the states instead of this big bureaucracy in Washington, DC. I mean, what do you do when China is burning all the coal and they're sending the, the they're sending the ashes over the United States? Because that's what happens. It takes three and a half days and it blows over the United States. In the meantime, we're keeping things good. We produce clean coal. We're going to produce clean energy, but we have to get back to energy. We're spending uh, trillions of dollars uh, on artificial weak energy that's not going to fire up our plants. Our plants have to be fired up. We have a phenomena coming up right now, and I was talking about it the other day to David, and that's AI, little things, simple, two little simple letters, but it's big. And I realized the other day, more than anything, when we were at David's house and talking to a lot of geniuses from Silicon Valley and other places, they need electricity at levels that nobody's ever experienced before to have to be successful, to be a leader in AI the amount of electricity that is like double what we have right now and even triple what we have right now. They are, they are, it's incredible how much they need to be the leader. And we're going to have to be able to do that. And a windmill turning with its blade, knocking out the birds and everything else is not going to be able <laughs> to 
make yeah. us competitive. You'll have China. What about what about, what about nuclear, Mr. President? Yeah. So l- let me just give you a statistic nuclear on this. China's is okay. building 150 nuclear reactors, and they're only spending about $2,500 a kilowatt. In the U.S., we're not building any, and our cost to build them is about 10,000 bucks a kilowatt. And China's about to build as much capacity as 20% of the total U.S. production in nuclear. We clearly have a problem here in nuclear. We do, and uh, nuclear is okay with me. And what we're doing is, you know, if you look at Alabama, you look at a couple of states where they built these plants and they had cost overruns that are, nobody's ever seen anything like it, where they're costing $25 billion to build a plant. There were a couple of them built in the South. I won't mention the places, but you know the places. And they came out at numbers that I think the most expensive things ever built in our country. And the inspectors would go in, they say, those walls aren't thick enough, knock them down and build another wall. And, you know, the environmental people were brutal. You know, in France and in other places where they do have a lot of nuclear, they build small plants all the same. And if they need double the amount, they'll build two of them, as opposed to the nonsense that we've done where we build these massive plants and they never get built and they have cost overruns of of three, four, five hundred percent. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. No, I'm okay with nuclear, but you have to do it in a way that makes sense. And they they have nuclear applications today that can be built and can be built reasonably inexpensively. But right. nuclear d- certainly is very strong power. Can I shift the conversation to foreign policy just for a minute, just to make sure we get we get time to talk about foreign policy? Is that okay with you guys? Yes. Mr. President, I've really appreciated your, your comments saying that you want to bring a peace deal to the war in Ukraine so that people stop dying. And I wholeheartedly agree with, with that sentiment. But I've seen that Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, is talking about actually putting NATO troops or French troops in Ukraine as potentially a next step. And that could be a tripwire for more NATO troops coming in. Can you guarantee that no matter what, you're not going to put American boots on the ground in Ukraine? Is that something you can say definitively? I would guarantee it. I wouldn't do it. No, it's different for France. You know, they're neighbors, more or less. We have an ocean in between. It's different for Germany, although Germany is much less involved than they should be and other countries. But, uh, you know, we have a big ocean in between. One of the things I think is so unfair, David, I think it's terrible, is that we're giving probably we're at least a hundred billion dollars more than Europe, meaning Europe as, as a whole put together. And the economies are similar size, believe it or not, that put together and us is about a very similar economy size. But it's much more important for them. It's important for everyone. You have to have, look, this would have never happened if I were president. It would have never, Putin would have never done it. And it happened for two reasons. It also happened because oil went through the roof and he had he had all this money to prosecute the war. But the oil was at a much lower level, the price of oil. He wouldn't have been able to afford the war. All of a sudden, when it hit almost $100 a barrel, he said, you know, I mean, he, he's one of the few to make money during a war because the oil has gone and it stayed very high. It's extremely high right now and it's going up. Oil prices all over the country are going up, as you probably have noticed. But yeah. I will tell you, that would have never happened. Ukraine would have hap- never happened. Uh, the Israeli attack would have never happened. And inflation would have never happened. Those are three big things. Inflation would have never happened. But with Ukraine... And now it's very much, uh, look, Ukraine is now, I read the other day where they don't have the soldiers, they don't have the manpower, they want to use uh, children, they want to use old people, very old people, people that are not really perhaps uh, equipped to fight. Uh, They're not doing well. Yeah, the average age of their soldier is like 43 now. So they're running out of, they're literally running out of people. To make a peace deal there, would you be willing to take NATO expansion off the table if that's what it took to get the Russians and Ukrainians to make a deal? Would you be willing to do that? So for 20 years, I heard that NATO, uh, if Ukraine goes into NATO, it's a real problem for Russia. I've heard that for a long time. And I think that's really why this war started. I'm not sure that this war would have started. Uh, Biden was saying all of the wrong things. And one of the wrong things he was saying, no, Ukraine will go into NATO. That's one of the many things he said. When I listened to him speak, I said, this guy is going to start a war. Because as you know, for four years, there was never even talk of Russia going into Ukraine. That would have never happened. Russia was not going to attack Ukraine. As soon as I got out, they started to form along the lines. And I thought that Putin maybe will. He's a good negotiator. I thought he was going to be doing that for negotiation purposes. Then all of a sudden they attacked. And I said, what's going on here? But if you look at the rhetoric from Biden, uh, 
he, he was saying the opposite of what, in my opinion, you had to say. The things totally. he was saying, and he's still saying it. He's saying things that are so crazy. Inflammatory. Yeah. I 100% agree. And, yeah. you know, it turns out that the month before the Russians invaded, Blinken told Lavrov that the administration was not only going to bring Ukraine into NATO, but that they thought it was okay for the United States to put nuclear weapons in Ukraine. So no wonder the Russians hit the roof. I mean, you talk about uh, provocation. Well, let's say you were running Russia. You wouldn't be too happy. And that's always been off the table. You know, there it's a border. And it's always been, you know, I don't think that they would have, if they thought that that was going to remain sort of a territory where you don't have NATO, but they don't want to have soldiers right on their border. They don't want to have it. It's always been understood. And that's even before Putin. Uh, it's always been understood that that was a no-no. And now you can go against their wishes, and it doesn't mean they're right when they say that. But that was very provocative. And now it's even more provocative. And they're talking about, uh, I hear routinely, they're now talking about Ukraine entering NATO. And now I hear France wants to go in and fight. Well, I wish them a lot of luck. I think good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, can I ask you about Israel-Palestine? So after October 7th, what's the right path to just resolve this once and for all and just move forward? Again, it's so sad to me because it would have never happened. Iran was broke. They had no money. I sanctioned countries that wanted to buy oil from Iran. And I would have made a fair deal with Iran. I was going to get along with Iran. I was going to get along with everybody. We did the Abraham Accords. I think eventually Iran would have been in the Abraham Accords. We had four strong countries go in and nobody went in since I got out. That whole thing should have been loaded up right now. Would have been, it should have been full. They did nothing with the Abraham Accords that everybody said were great. They said, we're going to get the ultimate prize because of that. It was amazing. If anybody else did it, if a Democrat did it, they would have they would have gotten uh, what they would have gotten every prize in the book, every prize in the book. But I did it. And it was a great thing that we did. It was a phenomenal thing. But when you look at what happened now and you see what's going on, it's very, 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 very sad. That attack would have never happened in a million years. Iran didn't have the money for Hamas. They didn't have the money for Hezbollah. They didn't have the money for any of the 28 other cells of terror or whatever you want to call them. Iran was broke. I say respectfully, they had no money and they weren't given money. And actually, it was a big story when I was uh, toward the end of my term. It was a lot of big stories that there, there was no terror going on because Iran didn't have the money. They had to survive. We would have made a deal good for everybody. Everybody would have been happy. The main thing is Iran can't have a nuclear weapon. That was my main thing. The deal was a simple deal. Iran can't have a nuclear, uh, you know, it can't have a missile, can't have a nuclear missile. It cannot have that nuclear capability. Other than that, we talk about everything. They would have been very happy. It would have been fine. And you would have had peace in the Middle East. The problem is I had them at a point where you could have negotiated. A child could have made a deal with them. And Biden did nothing. He did nothing. A he child, doesn't like to negotiate. A young man <laughs> that knew nothing or a young woman that knew nothing in kindergarten could have made a deal with Iran at that time because they wanted to make a deal. And Biden never took advantage of it. Now, they put back no sanctions, all of the different things that they gave them. China buys billions and billions of dollars of oil every month, many billions of dollars a month. Other people are buying. So Iran now has $250 billion cash. They made it all in three and a half years. And now they're much tougher to deal with. And I will tell you, I got along great with Kim Jong-un. We solved that problem. Nobody was in danger. But this is a big problem. This is a real problem. And within 90 days or so, they're going to have and could have very well a nuclear weapon. And wow. Israel is a big is a big difference in Israel between Iran with a nuclear weapon and Iran without a nuclear weapon. And lots of luck in that negotiation. That's going to be a much more difficult negotiation. President Trump, I, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, Roe v. Wade. You promised uh, your base that you would overturn Roe v. Wade. You added three people to the Supreme Court and you delivered on that promise. This might be the issue that determines the election. And many people believe it is. Are you going to do a national abortion ban? Would you support that? Yes or no? So uh, I don't need a national ban because it's up to the states. Right now, what I did is something that people have wanted to do for from day one, 51 years it's been going on. And if you remember over the years, you're too young. 
But over the years, all they wanted to do is they wanted to make, take it out of the federal government and move it into the states. And I got that done with the selection of three great justices. I got it done. And it was a big thing. But I will say over the last 10 years, or maybe a little bit more than that, they started talking about the number of weeks and this and that. A lot of different subjects came in. It was no longer just simply bringing it back. Every legal scholar from Democrat to Republican, liberal, conservative, they all wanted it brought, given to the states. Because from a legal standpoint, from a lot of other standpoints, including even a moral standpoint, they wanted it brought back to the states. And what I did is I got it back to the states. And now the states are in charge and the people are voting. And some votes are coming out the way certain people want it. And some votes aren't coming out the way certain people want it. I mean, if you look at Ohio, I would say it was a more liberal vote than people would have thought. And you could say that for Kansas. And then you look at Texas, it was a different story. But the people of the states have got that issue now and they're voting. And the one thing that we have to remember that there's been a lot of radicalism talked about, and the radicalism is really on the left because they're willing to do abortions in the eighth and ninth month. Month, And even beyond that, I mean, we have some people, the governor, take a look at the governor of Virginia, the former governor of Virginia, where he talked about, we will kill the baby after the baby is born. That's a very radical stance. And hopefully that's all going to be taken off the table now. But just to put it simply, it's now up to the states. And like Ronald Reagan, I'm a believer in the exceptions, the three exceptions, as you know, and uh, rape, incest, life of the mother, uh, danger for the life of the mother. And we have uh, a situation now where it's in the state's hands and the states are going to be uh, voting. The last thing people want, the people are going to be voting. The last thing people want is for that to go back into the federal government. It was always fought, and very importantly, and people wanted it, they wanted it back in the states, where it belongs legally and for a lot of other reasons. So you wouldn't support a national ban? No, I wouldn't support a national ban. No, I would not. Just shifting back to foreign policy for a moment, Mr. President, on the relationship with China, it's funny how Democrats and Republicans seem to have a unified voice and banging the drums on the, the rise of China. Do you think that war with China is inevitable? And if not, how do we avoid it? I think it's not inevitable. I think it's unlikely. Uh, I know President Xi very well, and we got along great until COVID. Then I wasn't so happy with him because they gave it to us. I said it came from the Wuhan lab. I was right about that. Uh, they said then it started in Italy, and then it started in France. It started everywhere but there, but it started in China. And it was a uh, many, many millions of people died all over the world and cost the world probably $60 trillion, which is more money than China has and more money than anybody has. The death and destruction has been unbelievable. But I think it's, I think it's high. If you have the right president, uh, we can live at peace with China. We can do very well with China, compete with China. But we don't have the right president right now. He's not respected by China. He's being laughed at by China. And he's a Manchurian candidate. I mean, he's received money from China, his family. And that makes him, to me, uh, somebody that shouldn't be negotiating. I think he's got a conflict of interest. Uh, but no, I don't see war with China as being inevitable at all. President Trump, do you think that Fauci and our government funded gain-of-function research? And do you think we should really be pursuing the investigation deeply into that? And if we did fund gain-of-function research, what does that say about our government and taking ownership of it, because a lot of us lost a lot of years, kids didn't go to school, and uh, it caused economic damage. As you pointed out earlier, the amount of money you had to spend to try to avoid a depression was really severe. And if we funded that, what does that make you think about our government and then Fauci covering it up? If that is in fact true, what does that make you think about our government? So if you remember, I'm the one that stopped it. And I stopped it maybe for uh, a lucky reason or an unusual reason. I said, why are we paying money to China? It wasn't about gain of function or anything else. It was, why are we paying money to China? China's got a lot of money and they're doing fine. You know, we're considered like, uh, we, they want us to consider them a growing nation, a, a nation in distress, all sorts of things, because they always take advantage of every treaty by saying that they need, you know, they're a, a, a 
an improving nation. I heard the other day they have all different terms for changing, but they're a growing nation. Well, we're a growing nation too. We're a nation that's becoming a third world nation based on what we're seeing. But I was the one that stopped that when I saw that. I was the one that stopped that. Uh, the Fauci thing is an interesting phenomena. Uh, he's a much, I was not a big fan of his. As you know, he said, no, let everybody come in from China. I overrode him on that. I overrode him on a lot. But he wanted the people from China. When I heard about this, I stopped it. We had a room loaded up with people and nobody could even believe it. But I stopped it. We would have lost hundreds of thousands of people more, maybe more, much more, maybe over the millions, but hundreds of thousands of people more had I not stopped people coming in from China. Did he because lie to you about the origin? Of COVID. Well, I've always said the origin was, uh, you know, where it came from, where it originally came from was the Wuhan lab. I happen to think it escaped from the Wuhan lab. I mean, I don't believe it came from uh, the bats in 2000 miles away caves. Uh, I don't believe it came from other countries as China tried to convince people it did. Uh, I thought it should have been called the China virus because it was a very much more accurate term than COVID. Nobody knows what COVID even means. Why is it COVID? Uh, but uh, no, I was always. Uh, but did Fauci lie to you, I guess, is what the American people want to know. Did Fauci lie to you? And if he did, should he be prosecuted? I don't think uh, I dealt. With, you have to understand, Fauci was a much bigger factor in the Biden administration than he was in the Trump administration. I didn't rely on him that much because I didn't trust him. Uh, I would say got along with him. Fine. Not really. But I didn't trust him. And Again, I was the one that stopped the money going to China. I didn't like it. I didn't stop it because of COVID. I didn't stop it because of anything other than why are we paying money to China? It was strange. They should pay us money. We shouldn't pay them money. And one of the things I can tell you, the World Health Organization, so we pay them almost $500 million and China pays them $39 million. And so I got out of the World Health Organization. They did absolutely nothing. They called it totally wrong. I got out. They called me and they said, we'll do anything to keep you in, anything, anything. I said, well, why are they paying 39 million? We're paying almost 500 million. And they said, well, we'll work out a deal where you can pay much less. I said, well, now you're starting to talk. But even that, it was very popular when I got out. It was a very politically, it would have been very hard to go back in. People were thrilled that I got out. I could have made a deal to go in for 39 million. They offered me a deal to go in for 39 million and I actually turned it down. I said, you know, it should be a third. It should be, if you look at, we're at 350 million and they're at 1.4 billion people, right? So it should have been 25% or less than that. But I didn't want to quibble, but I could have gone back in immediately for $39 million as opposed to 500. Then a, a horrible, horrible election, which helped destroy our country took place in 2020, and they went back in, and they're paying more than $500 million. And they knew I could have made a deal. Now, it's a lot of money, not when you talk about the world, but it's still a lot of money. And it, but it shows you the stupidity of the whole thing. They could have made a deal for $39 million. Instead, they're paying much more than they paid even before. And that's the way the mindset of our country is. And here's the big part. China totally controls the WHO. China totally controls them. We have very little control over them. And now they want to give control over our whole country to them, which would be a terrible mistake. Fauci brings up sort of the kind of deep state personality that you talked about in 2016 that's kind of like riddled all over the government. How much progress do you think you made and how? what do you want to do if you become president in November? And do you have goals around the deep state this time around? And what are they? Well, I have a lot of things. I mean, I did a lot of things in the FBI. I fired a lot of their top people, including Comey, who was terrible at what he did, a terrible person and terrible at what he did. Uh, I fired McCabe and, you know, I don't have to go through Lisa and Strzok and all of the, the lovers. And oh, I fired the whole group of people. <laughs> I got rid of them. And, uh, and, you know, so many of the agents are so incredible in the FBI down below. But uh, we got rid of a lot. We, uh, you take a look at the world health again. We got out of the world health. We got out of the, uh, this is a similar thing that, you know, this is really similar to your answer, but we got out of the world health organization, which was a tremendous thing. We got rid of the Paris Accord. The Paris Accord was a disaster for us. We were going to pay a trillion dollars and other countries were paying nothing. 
Russia was paying nothing. China was paying nothing. It didn't even kick in for China until 2030, whereas with us, it kicked in immediately. So I got rid of the Paris Accord. I did a lot of things having to do with not only people, but tremendous amounts of money because the Paris Accord was so unfair. And I said, you know, when I do this, people are not going to like it, but I have to do it because it's right. People loved it. The public understood it. They loved it. And now they've gone back into the Paris Accord at the same terms and even worse than the terms I got out. It's really a shame. It's so many things. It's so sad to see so many things. I, I mean, the WHO, the Paris Accord, you take a look at these things. They could have gone back if they wanted to go back. If they had it, they could have gone back for a fraction of what they were doing. And they're very unfair to the United States. We're like a lapdog for every other country. Mr. President, I, I know you've running out of time here. So but I, we haven't had a chance to for you to speak to the border situation yet. So I want to give you a chance to to address that because that's always been really one.